So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us at our Mechanics Institute program online. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events. And we're very pleased to welcome you to our program with award-winning Edinburgh-based author, Maggie O'Farrell for her new book, Hamnet, a novel of the plague. And Maggie will be in conversation with Philippa Kelly, the dramaturg of Cal Shakes. Uh, she is one of our Bay Area's leading experts on Shakespearean drama. If uh, you're new to the Mechanics Institute, uh, we were founded in 1854 and we're one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. We feature a general interest library, an international chess club, and our ongoing author and literary programs, and our Friday night cinema lit film series. So please visit our website, milibrary.org. We're also very pleased to co-sponsor this program with California Shakespeare Theater. And please visit their website, uh, calshakes.org, to see all of their programs and events that are online and classes and wonderful podcasts. Uh, they have so much going on and we're very pleased to co-sponsor with them for the first time. And hopefully this will be the beginning of a great partnership. Hamnet, this gorgeous new novel gives a reimagined account of the Bards family on Henley Street in Stratford on Avon, England circa 1580 during the days of the Black Death. The portrayal of William Shakespeare as a young and up and coming playwright his wife, Agnes, a free-spirited healer, and their vulnerable son, Hamnet, and kin offer a deep dive into Shakespearean life, history, and human nature. This book recently won the Women's Prize in Fiction. And um, after our program, please remember, you can put your questions in the chat, and we will be participating with you in, in some Q&A. Also, Maggie O'Farrell's book, Hamnet, is available at your local bookstore and also at alexanderbook.com. Now I'd like to introduce our guests. Maggie O'Farrell was born in Northern Ireland and grew up in Wales and Scotland and now lives in Edinburgh. She is the author of The Hand That First Held Mine, winner of the Costa Novel Award, Instructions for a Heat Wave, as well as This Must Be the Place, and her most recently acclaimed, I am, I am, I am, 17 Brushes with Death. And Philippa Kelly is resident dramaturg for the California Shakespeare Theater. She has published 11 books and her latest, and 98 articles, and her latest edited in the book called Diversity, Inclusion, and Representation in Contemporary Dramaturgy, Case Studies from the Field. She is also proud to lead a year-round community theater group entitled Berkeley Theater Explorations, which is to make dramaturgy a foundational to community theater appreciation and participation. She is also running, she is also offering uh, Run the Canon, a lively short dis discourse on Shakespearean plays and also in depth with Philippa Kelly uh, through Cal Shakes. So uh, once again, please welcome author Maggie O'Farrell and Philippa Kelly. Thank you so much, Laura. It's, and it's just an honor to be here and such an honor to be here with um, Maggie O'Farrell, who's won uh, so many prizes for her books. I, I can't believe at your young age how prolific you've been um, in terms of, you know, writing all these novels. She's won um, a Betty Trask Award. She's won a Somerset Maugham Award. He's one of my favorite authors. Um, she's won, as Laura mentioned, the Costa Novel Award. Um, gosh, you've, you're amazing. Um, what I want to begin by asking is, uh, what gave you the initial inspiration to begin this novel about Shakespeare and his family? 
Um, well, thank you very much, Philippa. It's lovely to well, sort of meet you. <laughs> um, I mean, I could say it's a novel that I've wanted to write for a really long time. Um, and I had several kind of forays into it. And I, and every time I sort of veered away from it, and I've, I think I've actually written three books instead of writing Hamlet, or as a kind of distraction for writing Hamlet. But I actually first heard about Hamlet the boy. You know, I've known about him for a really long time because I had... I had this absolutely brilliant English teacher at high school and we studied the play Hamlet for my Scottish hires so I was 16 rising 17 and the play just really got under my skin as I think it probably does with quite a lot of adolescents and I think certainly a kind of particular type of adolescent perhaps um, perhaps a little bit gloomy and prone to melancholy maybe wears quite a lot of black and I was certainly one of those the place I used to like to hang out most in I grew up in this, uh, well, I spent my teenage years in this very small Scottish seaside town and there was this ancient medieval churchyard and the roof had come off the church. So I used to hang around there quite a lot. There was a lot of ivy and sort of very picturesque ruins. So you can see why the play Hamlet would have got under my skin. But just my teacher mentioned in passing one day that Shakespeare had had a son who had died at the age of 11 and his name was Hamlet. And I don't know why this just really struck me and I have a really strong memory of sitting in this very cold classroom and looking down at the cover of the play and just putting my finger over the L and taking it off again and putting it down again and thinking it's the same name you know and what does this mean and even you know even though, even though I was only a teenager I knew at a very instinctive level that it was a very significant act and I didn't know then you know as I know now that Shakespeare is a really mysterious person you know we know so little about him you know there's such an odd imbalance with him because we have this enormous wealth of his work his plays and his poetry but on the other hand what we actually know about him concrete facts about his biography are incredibly scant you know we only have six examples of his signature yeah. there are so few concrete things that we can hang on to but it just has always seemed to me that you know calling perhaps your greatest play probably your most memorable tragic hero after your dead son is not nothing. You know, it's not insignificant. It's speaking huge volumes. It's telling us an enormous amount about him as an artist and as a man and as, as a father. But it's always seen, I've always been baffled by the idea that Hamlet as a, the boy has been so overlooked. He's been very underwritten about in history. You know, he's been, um, I, I've always been felt he's never been given his significance and his due. You know, when I was a student, I studied literature at university and I read these big kind of 500 page biographies of Shakespeare. And Hamlet's lucky if he gets maybe two mentions. You know, they mentioned he was born and they mentioned he died. And his death is always wrapped up by biographers and scholars in statistics about child mortality in the Elizabethan era. Almost as if the implication is that it wasn't that big a deal because you know lots of children died and they would have been half expecting it you know and I've always been skewered through the heart by this sort of you know it's a terribly presumptuous thing to assume you know I just want to say to these people you know just read read the opening scenes of Hamlet with this in mind and tell me that that man didn't grieve for this boy mm, yes because um Hamlet was written, what, about five years, or finished about five years after Hamnet's death. Yeah, well, and, that's what, I, I mean, yeah. the, it's, you know, it's also, as you know, it's hard to date these things, but the Globe Theatre dates it as 1601, which is, yeah, yeah. Uh, five years after he died, four, yeah. Yeah, four or five years, yeah. Yes. So just, and, and um, everybody, when you read this novel, which you have to read, it's just brilliant, but um, you'll find so much in it in the way that Maggie has put together her story of how Shakespeare related to his wife and family. Shakespeare's wife really has, um, I, I see her as almost like that, uh, even though it's not first person, the narrative voice in so much of this novel. So it's really giving a window into his wife uh, his own psyche and the psyches of both children, as well as the relationships with uh, Shakespeare's family and, and, and to a lesser extent, actually, his wife's family. So that so many parts about it, you think, oh, my God, that just slots it into place. That's It's so provocative and evocative. Um, 
And so Maggie, um, well, you've had already enormous acclaim for this novel. When you think about it, is there any part of it that um, stands out to you as the part with which you began or did you begin at the beginning? Well, as I said, I, uh, I, it is something that I've been thinking about writing for a while. And I did have several kind of goes at it. You know, I, I every time I finished a book, I would get down my Hamlet sort of books and my Shakespeare biographies and <laughs> things from my shelf. And I, and I would read them again. I'd do a bit more research. And I'd, I, had a, I had a kind of document on my computer where I, would, I was writing things down. And I, but actually, when I came to it, I finished my, I wrote a memoir. And when I finished that, I kind of, sat myself down and looked myself in the eye and said, you know, either you have to write this book about mm. Hamlet or you just got to forget about it. You know, you've got to do mm. it or not do it. And, you know, mm. you know, now or never, <laughs> you know, I kind of gave myself a talking to. And actually I looked at the document which, where I had about probably about 20,000 words and I realized I'd started it all in completely the wrong place. You know, I think the first decision you have to make when you write a novel is you think about the kind of chronological time Mm -hmm. of your book and you have to decide at which point along that line you're going to jump in you know where does your where does your novel begin where does the story start and I realized I started in completely the wrong place and I wanted to put him I wanted to put him the boy Hamnet absolutely center stage right at the start mm -hmm. so it begins when he is he's 11 years old it's just probably about a week or so before his death and his twin sister Judith falls ill and he's looking for someone to help and I knew that I wanted to begin with him but it wasn't, it was a strange, you know, it is a strange because it's the first book I've written. I mean, I, I wrote a book a while ago set in the 1930s, but this is the first book I've ever written in deep time, I suppose, you know, and it was, it was no, you know, there was so much vertigo, I think, involved in embarking on this novel, because not only was I needing to go back to the 16th century, which is a long, which is a long time, um, and people's lives then are so different to mine you know so and everything is different you can't take anything for granted even the very language which your characters are speaking but also I had to inhabit the life of Shakespeare and that's no mean feat you know because it feels incredibly presumptuous to you know start inhabiting him as a character so that's one of the reasons why I never ever use his name he's never named in the book I, the name Shakespeare doesn't appear anywhere and I don't refer to him as William and I don't refer to him as Will. You know, it's impossible. And I found it impossible to write a sentence, a fictional sentence saying, you know, William Shakespeare walked up the path and knocked on the door. And you know, as soon as I typed that, I found myself pulled up out of the narrative mm -hmm. and just thinking, I sound like such an Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought, well, if I can't stay submerged in the narrative, I can't expect readers to. So, and also in a sense, I wanted you know, to ask readers to forget everything they think they know about him and try to see him as a man, you know, as a, as a human being, um, not yet as, you know, the greatest playwright who ever lived, this kind of beer moth, this icon, just to remember him as a human with a, with a beating heart and a pulse. Mm, mm. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. Um, Maggie mentioned her memoir, um, I Am, I Am, I Am, 17 Brushes with Death. And I was really struck with that, that um, part the voice of the memoir feels like Agnes's voice um, <laughs> in Hamnet. And so I was wondering, if, if, I was wondering, you know, how that had led you into um, inhabiting Shakespeare's wife. Well, I think in a sense, you know, I think all books are a reaction to their predecessor or yes. I found it anyway you know you yeah. often I found that sometimes I finish a book and yeah. it, it, I mean it's not as if it, you know one book is a springboard for the other but often you you know I feel I suppose what I feel is that every book that I write I have a, an enormously steep learning curve within that experience you know within the two or three years it takes me to write it and, and in a sense with every book I want to try something different you know I remember when I started a novel um, which is about an Irish family called Instructions for a Heat Wave. I remember wanting to try to get to grips with the idea of polyphony, of you know, writing a book that's narrated by five different people, and in one scene you switch between four or five different characters' heads. And so I, I wrote the book in order to learn how to do it. Mm. But then sometimes when you've when you've you know you've you've set yourself this hurdle and then you manage to clear it, you want to put what you've learned into action and to try something different with it. You know? So mm -hmm. I suppose. You know, I suppose there is all, I mean, I think with every writer's work, you can see certain threads running through their book. 
Mm. Um, and I don't know, for some reason, I, I, you know, I never, ever expected to write a memoir. You know, I've always felt very wedded to fiction. You know, I feel like it runs through me like my skeleton. But, mm. so, you know, the, the memoir was a bit, of a, surprise, a bit of a surprise. But I've always thought really that, you know, you don't necessarily choose the books you write. The books choose you. Mm. And you have to, sometimes you just have to go with it. There is always, often there's a book. You know, sometimes you get these periods in your life where you're not quite sure what you're going to write next. Mm. But generally, there's always an idea or a concern or a, a kind of uh, a project that will, will just shout so loudly you can't ignore it and you have to just do, you have to go with it. Mm. And I think that's what happened with Hamnet. You know, it was something that I've always felt pulled towards. It's almost been kind of tidal. And I just it just felt like the right time. I think, you know, there is that sense that planets are aligned. Perhaps I'm the right age. My children are the right age. Because actually one of the things that always prevented me from one of the things that often presented me prevented me from writing Hamnet is that my I didn't I had an odd superstition that I couldn't write it until my own son was past the age of 11 mm. because I knew that I I knew that parts of my own son would filter into probably filter into Hamnet and actually quite a lot has I think mm. and I I couldn't do it until I knew that he was safely past that age so for some mm. reason the planets were aligned I think yeah oh that's fascinating um and then one thing I was wondering about, um, uh, 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 just I was thinking about um, Shakespeare's wife and well, let's just say his wife. And um, what do you think about the fact that um, Shakespeare's wife in real life was bequeathed only the second best bed by a man who left most of his property to Susanna and 360 pounds which is not nothing mm. to to Judith um, who was his unfavorite daughter um, as in what we understand about them um, so basically Judith would have gotten 37,587 pounds today um, or just shy of $50,000 US mm -hmm. um, so just putting that in context um what do you think about him and his loyalties and his feelings about his family? Well, I think the will is a very interesting document. And I think it's mm. very, I think having read it and having looked, I mean, obviously I haven't seen the original manuscript, but I've seen photocopies of the original manuscript. It is a very uncharacteristic document. It's very, very devoid of any affection whatsoever. You would never think mm. that the person who wrote probably the greatest lines and the greatest poetry about love and affection and marriage and fidelity and all different you know love in all its many guises you know the, the, it was written by the same person and actually I don't think he did write it I think I mean I, I think he I mean he was probably somebody was transcribing it for him I mean the man was dying probably of typhoid you know if you yeah. read descriptions of how he died and there's another document saying that the stream at the back of their garden had some kind of terrible, I think they described it as a sweating sickness. And it does right. seem like typhoid. I mean, typhoid's a particularly nasty death. But also, you know, the thing about the, I mean, you know, in, in Jacobean law, the wife of a, a man was entitled to a third of his estate. So he would have known that his wife was entitled to, I mean, you know, at the end of his life, Shakespeare was incredibly wealthy. He was the equivalent right. of a multimillionaire, you know, as well as being obviously a very good playwright mm -hmm. and a very good actor. He was a very, very savvy businessman. You know, he built up his company in London from the Chamberlain's men to the, the King's men. And, but also he'd sent all his money, you know, he lit, at the end of his career in London before he retired and came back to Stratford to live with his wife, um, he had sent all his money home to Stratford. Mm -hmm. he, he was still living in incredibly modest lodgings in, um, in the city of London. And in Stratford, he bought, he bought his wife and daughters an absolute mansion of a place. If any of you have ever been to Stratford, the house no longer exists, sadly, but the plot of land is vast. I mean, it was one of the biggest houses in Stratford. He bought that a year after Hamlet died with a huge amount of land. And he also bought cottages and fields. And, you know, he was known, I think, probably in Stratford. I mean, what intrigues me is he was probably known as quite a successful landlord. So he did have a vast fortune, absolutely vast fortune. Mm. And... Yeah, a third of it would have gone automatically to his wife and he did he does leave her the second best bed in his mm. will but I think what unless you see the document that behest is is what's called an interlineation it's squeezed in between two other lines mm. um and the thing about the sisters that yes so he, he does leave the vast fortune and the sort of 
what we'd now sort of call a power of attorney over the estate to Susanna. And, and I think it's, I think from what I can tell, he had a good relationship with Susanna's husband, who was a, a physician, uh, John Hall. There's, there's an awful lot of good doctors that appear in Shakespeare's work, <laughs> intriguingly. <laughs> uh, and Susanna did marry the, the physician in the town. Yeah. But I think what, with Judith, the situation is complicated because the, Judith is Hamlet's surviving uh, twin. And she just previously to Shakespeare's death had married quite late in life, um, a vintner called Thomas Quiney. And just before Shakespeare died and the, some biographers attribute Shakespeare's death to this, Thomas Quiney was held up in what was called a bawdy court, which meant that a woman in Stratford had named him as the father of her unborn child. And in, in society in, in those days, in the early 17th century, if a man was named as an unborn, uh, sorry, an, a child out of wedlock, you could be held up for um, immorality. Mm. And unfortunately, this woman who was called Margaret died in childbirth. So the son-in-law of J Judas' husband was in serious trouble. He was held up in court. So there would have been an enormous scandal in Stratford and it would have been very embarrassing. And it would have been, I mean, heartbreaking for poor Judith. Imagine if this is your, you know, your new marriage. So it's not long after that that Shakespeare died. And I think if you look at the will, what Shakespeare is trying to do is protect his money from this pretty feckless vintner, or his, you know, someone who owns a pub, basically, landlord from his son. He doesn't want this feckless son-in-law to get his hands on the money. And actually the, the amount of money he gives to Judith and he specifies it's for her, it's not for the, for the dodgy vintner. Um, I think he is taking care of her and he, he, he allows her to mm. live in, in the cottage and he, he leaves her a very valuable silver bowl. Mm. So I think, I think it's, the will is much more complicated than is often um, given credit for. Sorry, that's mm -hmm. a very long answer. <laughs> oh no, it's, it's, it's fascinating um, because there's so much speculation. Um, some people mm. say, you know, that Shakespeare went to extraordinary lengths to deprive his wife of that automatic third of the estate no. and all sorts of, of, of things like that. I've never seen any, any, any uh, proof of that. So whatsoever. Yes. I mean, to those people, I think I would say, you know, at the end of his career, he could have lived anywhere. He was an incredibly wealthy man but he chose to come back to Stratford to live out his retirement with his wife. That doesn't, to me, speak of somebody who disliked his wife. Yeah. And also, you know, again, I was talking about sending the money back. None of that implies somebody who loathes his wife. You know, and if you look through his play, I mean, I know you have to be very circumspect about interpreting the biography and the plays. You know, you can't yeah. always automatically assume that they are related. But there are so many examples of deep marital love and particularly yeah. very, very faithful wives, often in the face of inexplicable male behavior from their husbands. Um, yeah. I just, I don't know, I, I've never ever believed that he hated his wife. And I know that, you know, the narrative that we've been taught for almost half a century is that she was an older woman. You know, I've seen biographers who say she was old, she was stupid, she trapped him into marriage, you know, he hated her, he had to run to London, <laughs> run to, run away to, London to, get, to get away from her. And I've never found any evidence of that ever at all. You know, I, found, I got really sort of enraged actually on her behalf, yeah. thinking, you know, why has she been so badly treated? Why are we taught this narrative? Why are we told to hate her? Why, yeah. why, are, we, why are biographers and scholars and, you know, screenwriters and other novelists so determined yeah. to give him a retrospective divorce yeah but actually there's no evidence particularly either way yeah. I mean yes you can talk about the second best bed but then you can counter it by saying yes. but he went back to live with her in his retirement you know yes and I and do it, think there's you know and one of the things that one of my lightning bolt moments with her as a character was reading her, again another will her father's will so her father Richard Hathaway was a very successful sheep farmer and he died a year before um, she and William married and in his will, he leaves her a very generous dowry, really, for, for, for the daughter of a farmer. And in it, he, he refers to her as my daughter, Agnes. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I thought that, I thought, well, you know, my God, have we been calling her by the wrong name, you know, for almost 500 years? On top of everything else, she's been so vilified and, you know, the, the receiving end of so much hatred. Um, I thought, we, we, you know, this is the wrong name. Mm. So I, I gave this name back to her. I thought I wanted, if anyone knows her name, it should be her father. So I thought I wanted readers, again, to forget everything they think they know about the, the narrative of the ignorant strumpet peasant and open themselves up to a new interpretation. Perhaps their marriage was a partnership. They did love each other. And maybe she, perhaps she was illiterate. I mean, she probably was, you know, what daughter of a sheep farmer would have been taught to read, but yeah. maybe she had her own sense of artistry and intelligence.
Yeah. And one of the wonderful things about the lack of firm information about Shakespeare's life is that you've leapt in and given him a life. If you see what I mean, because every every biographer is giving him a, a life from from the story they're telling. And I, I just love what you did. Can we actually go to a little bit of a reading so that our listeners can get a sense of the the timbre of the novel. Well, I could start, if we've just been talking about Agnes, maybe I'll read a little bit about mm. um, them first meeting. So at this point in my, so there's lots, all sorts of debate as maybe people know um, about how, how the son of a Glover, you know, who only had a school education became to be such a famous playwright. And scholars often think of, refer to this as the lost years. No one really knows how he came from a rural market town to become a play. But one of the theories is that he was a tutor and he taught Latin. So that was the one I decided to go with. So in this section, he is the Latin tutor. On a morning in early spring, a Latin tutor is standing at the window of Hewland's farm, absently tugging on a hoop through his left ear. He is watching the trees. The boys are behind him. They are conjugating verbs, temporarily unheard by the tutor, who is intent on the startling contrast between the sharply blue spring sky and the new leaf green of the forest. The colours seem to fight, vying for supremacy, vibrancy, the green versus the blue, one against the other. The children's Latin verbs wash over him, through him, like wind through the trees. He is just about to turn and face his pupils when he sees from the trees a figure emerge. For a moment, the tutor believes it to be a young man. He is wearing <coughs> a cap, a leather jerkin, gauntlets. He moves out of the trees with a brand of masculine entitlement, covering the ground with booted strides. There is some kind of bird on his outstretched fist, chestnut brown with a creamy breast, its wings spotted with black. It sits hunched, subdued, its body swaying with the movement of its companions, its familiar. The tutor is imagining this person, this hawk-taming youth, to be some kind of factotum to the farm, a relative to the family, a visiting cousin, perhaps. Then he registers the long plait hanging over the shoulder, reaching past the waist, the jerkin laced tight around a form that curves suspiciously inwards at the middle. He sees the skirts, which had been bunched up, now hastily being dragged down around the stockings. He sees a pale oval face under the cap, an arched brow. The tutor moves closer to the glass, leaning on the sill and watches as the woman moves from the right to the left of the window frame, her bird riding on her fist, her skirt swishing around her boots. Then she enters the farmyard, moves through the chickens and geese, around the side of the house and is gone. He straightens, his frown vanished, her smile forming under his scant beard. Behind him, the room has fallen silent. He recalls himself, the lesson, the boys, the verb conjugation. He turns, he arches his fingers together as he imagines a tutor ought to do, as his own masters did at school not so long ago. Excellent, he says to them. They look towards him, plants turning towards the sun. He, he smiles at their soft, unformed faces, pale as unrisen dough in the light from the windows. He pretends not to see that the younger brother is being poked under the table with a peeled stick, that the elder has filled his slate with a pattern of repeated loops. He waits until they have half finished their exercise before he says, what is the name of that serving girl, the one with the bird? Thank you. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Oh, gosh. Um, can I ask, uh, when you, what is your day like <laughs> as a writer? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I would say it's not very organised. You know, I do know, I've heard other writers say, and I know other writer friends of mine who say that they will, you know, start at 9am and they'll work till 11 and they'll write so many words. But I, I don't know, I think I... I think I'm not really much of a planner either in life or in writing. And I think, and also, you know, I have three, I mean, my children are still quite young. I've got three children. And I mean, certainly this, <laughs> this year has been interesting. <laughs> it's an awful lot of uh, making things up as we go along, you know, because I mean, I, I'm quite used to working at home, obviously, but I'm not that used to having three children at home to homeschool. Mm. And so my eldest is 17, my youngest is eight. So, you know, I mean, and, and with children, as you know, as anyone who has children will know that, 
there are days when you sit down and you think, okay, I've got three hours before, you know, I have to go and pick them up at school. And then the phone will ring and it'll be the school and they say, you know, your child's fallen out of a tree. Can you come, can you come and pick them up? So you never know. You've just got to kind of roll with the punches. And I think the same is true of fiction. You know, I think I, it's particularly when I start a book, you know, I think it's very, you know, I often have an, a, a vague idea of what the plan will be. And I have a lot of notes and, you know, I think that the novel is going to go from, you know, A to B. Mm. But often what happens is that it, it, maybe a third of the way through or half of the way through the book, it takes a right angle. Um, mm. And the novel sort of takes its own, you know, it says, I'm, actually, we're not going A to B, we're going A to C or A to D. Mm. But I actually, I always quite like those moments and I, mm. I look forward to them because it seems to me that when a novel does take a right turn um, it's a book that's working on its own momentum that it's 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 got its own pulse suddenly mm. and mm. I'm quite open to that as I think you know it's, it's always a, a moment that I, I feel that the book is working when suddenly you realize that the place you thought you were going isn't actually where it's going at all it, it's, it's going somewhere else so I really like that and I think you know I mean it is you know there are some weeks I think when I think yeah this is fine it's all working I can do my writing and other weeks where I just think <laughs> this is all the terrible disaster I'm never going to write again you know and life keeps throwing spanners in my work but mm. that's probably true of all of us I think isn't it yeah it's interesting isn't it just thinking and then are you an evening writer as well or does that is, is, does that just change I used to be actually I think until I remember writing a lot in the evening when I just had one child yeah. And when he was quite young and I used to put him to bed at kind of 7 p.m. and then I would have the evening. But actually these days, I think <laughs> having three children is more tiring. And also a teen teenagers are up, you know. I mean, yeah. he goes to bed after me now and there's something about the house being busy, which I find, you know, I find that I really need, I work best when it's very quiet and I mm -hmm. the phone is off and there's no music and there's no people walking around. And, you know, during lockdown, I found it quite, even though my husband and I were sort of swapping around that he would do some homeschooling and I would work and then we'd swap over and I would do the homeschooling and he would work. But there was one morning in particular where, I don't know why, I was trying to work. I was in my, um, in the bedroom trying to write and my husband was with the kids, but every kind of two minutes, there'd be somebody coming in saying, mom, we need a blue pen, mom, <laughs> where are the paints? You know, where's the book? Do we need a jam jar? And I felt, I thought, I can't, I can't sustain any kind of concentration. So actually what I did was I went into my youngest daughter's uh, Wendy house, a kind of playhouse, which is tiny. Mm -hmm. So I crouched in there with my laptop and I <laughs> pulled the door shut behind me. And actually it was great. Nobody found me for two hours. So that was the kind of most sustained, <laughs> sustained mm. concentration I could find. But it just, I think it just, sometimes it works and other times it doesn't. And, but I think, you know, the life, the work of a writer anyway, if, probably particularly if you're writing fiction, there's only a really small part of that or maybe a, a, a lesser part of that, which that happens when you're sitting at your computer typing. You know, quite mm. a lot of the work you do I think happens when you're away and you're doing something mm. else. You're looking the other way. You're doing the laundry or the washing mm. up. Or, and so when know, that's think, happening, you, if you're doing your laundry and you have a thought, would you write, do you carry a notebook to write it down? Um, I do. I mean, I certainly write things that I have. I have a lot of notebooks all over the house, certainly. But I do. I and mean, there have always been certain problems, you know, it's particularly not, you know, there's every novel that you write you will come up against a series of brick walls you know there'll be a kind of part where you think I, I don't know how to solve this as mm -hmm. you know this is a conundrum or this scene isn't working or this part of the book isn't working and actually I think what I think the really good thing about having children is that you're constantly pulled out of your ivory tower you're constantly pulled out of your study and you don't sit there with your head in your hands you have to just go and engage with life and I've often found that when I'm doing something else I'm pushing a pram or pushing a swing or you know playing in the park with my kids that something will just twist and fall into place and I'll think aha that's what I need to do mm. you know I do think that every book you write there's a kind of engine it has its own engine it runs at the back of your head all the time and sometimes yeah. even you can't even hear it and then somehow something will slide into place or something will become unknotted and, yeah. and a solution will appear yeah and then of course there's all the you know the buckets and buckets of research that's obviously gone into this book which what what's one of the things everybody that's so beautiful about this book is that it you know it, i i feel like it it doesn't at all wear its research like a top 
you know, like a, a, a top gallon hat or whatever those things are called. <laughs> it, the, the research is seamlessly woven into this story. And, and it makes me think of, there was a comment once by a writer that I loved. It was something like um, um, storytelling takes suffering and makes it something that we can live with. And so I was thinking about your own life and the, you know, uh, beginning with when you were hospitalized for a year, when you were a child, and then you've had, you know, the, the famous 17 brushes with death and thinking, I wonder whether those, uh, the, the intensity of those experiences um, has, have actually contributed to you being able to take this suffering and make it something that you can live with. Does that sound too trite? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's inevitable that every, you know, a writer's experience will inevitably filter into the fiction. Mm. So, you know, I think, you know, it's, I think all fiction is a kind of mm. patchwork or palimpsest of things that you make up, mm. you know, from mm. scratch and things that you maybe borrow from research or have heard people talking about and other things that you might have experienced yourself. I think mm. that's, I think that's always going to happen. There are always going to be elements but I think, and I think you take that, but I think, I think the odd thing about fiction, I think, you know, life alchemizes into fiction, certainly in certain ways mm. or certain strains of it. But actually by the time you've recast it and redrafted it and rewritten it and maybe placed it in the 16th century and, you know, reimagined it in a different mm. place, it doesn't feel like it's yours anymore. It feels like mm. a kind of at an arm's length. And of course there will be, you know, I think that's why it's odd for, people who know you well to read your books because sometimes they can see the joins you know and I think it is a strange experience and I find that you know re reading books written by close friends or my husband or you know that there, there are certain things where you suddenly think oh gosh <laughs> I remember this <laughs> you know and there it is in, in a different you know a different guide or you know a different time a different person the words are coming out of a different person's mouth but I think that's I think that's always going to happen. Mm. Um, oh, we have the lovely Laura back with us. Um, do, do, uh, there is one question I'd love to ask, but I'll, I'll save it um, and we'll go to audience questions. Great. Well, I'll start with the first question, which I put in the chat. I'd like to know more about how you came to this very specific kind of voice, which is actually, I think the novel has a sort of magic, the way that you've written. It just draws you in and you're kind of in this spell of this whole time and place and also about your discoveries and how you did research and what was unexpected and surprising and how that infused or informed uh, the writing of the book. Well I think the voice I mean the voice is something that I, I try hard I try hard not to think about it too much it's a bit like staring at the sun you know I think I think you have to allow novels in a sense to sort of a bit like bread dough, you've got to allow them to prove and you, and you mustn't look at them too much, you know, and I think the voice is something that, you know, I think novels will find their own shape and assume their own level somehow, a bit like the water table, and you have to just trust that will happen. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, I think one of the things I really wish that I, someone had told me when I was starting out writing is that you don't have to begin at the beginning, you know, you can start halfway through, you can start a third of the way through. The only important thing is, is just to put words down to, you know, be in a room with your characters and get them talking and see what happens, actually. I think mm -hmm. there is that. I think it's really important, that, particularly when you're starting something, especially something that's so distant in time or mm -hmm. so unfamiliar to, you know, your own world, you've got to just try it out, see what happens, mm -hmm. you know, try one thing and if it doesn't work, just try another. So I think it was more with that. But I mean, certainly the research for the book was very, I mean, obviously a lot of it was library based, you know, because there's, so much written about Shakespeare, you know, it was written by him and about him. You know, you could spend the, all of your life in a library reading about Shakespeare and you'd probably, at the end of your life, still there'd still be books you hadn't read. So I did do a lot of that and that was, that was fascinating, you know, and I learned so much and, you know, and I tried wherever possible in the, in the years in which I'm writing about his life, never to go against something which I, I could see was true, you know, in a kind of documentary evidence. I always, I never tried to ignore anything that, or just if, if it wasn't convenient to what I was saying, I thought, well, I, I have to take this on board, you know, because especially when you're writing a book like this, you have to always remember and respect the idea that these people were real, you know, and you have to be careful with that. 
you can't ever forget that there is a real boy called Hamlet Shakespeare in that churchyard somewhere who was buried. Mm. And you have to be careful with that, you know, even though it was so long ago and everybody who knew him has been long, long dead, he was still real. And I think you, that was always at the forefront of my mind. And I had the printed out on my pin board, the entry from the Stratford on Avon Paris Register about his burial, you know, which is just, it's so heartbreaking to see this beautiful copper plate handwriting and in Latin filius of William Shakespeare. Mm. Um, so that was something, but actually for Agnes in particular, um, Hamlet's mother, I, you know, because her life is so, you know, if we think we know little about Shakespeare, what we know about his wife is so scant, you know, that, I mean, her birth isn't even recorded because she was born mm. before parish records began. And we just, we know basically that she got married and she had three children and one of them died as a child and not a great deal else, actually. <laughs> and so for her, and also because her lives of women in those days were so, so distant and so unfamiliar to mine as a woman in the 21st century. So for her, I wanted to give her, I mean, I, I mentioned, you know, wanting to give her her own sense of intelligence and artistry. Mm. And so I wanted, I decided to give her two of the um, areas of expertise, which are very, are prevalent in Shakespeare's plays, one of which is herbology, which of course makes, a, mm -hmm. a, it's quite evident in the play Hamlet, particularly when Ophelia hands plants to people, those plants mm -hmm. are cures for mm -hmm. um, flaws she sees in their character. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to give that to Agnes and also uh, Hawking, there's an awful lot of metaphors in Shakespeare about Hawking. And so I, <laughs> I actually, and this is the funnest thing I've ever done in the name of research for a book. I went to the Scottish borders and I learned to fly a kestrel mm -hmm. um, in a woods and that was that was fantastic I did on really really rainy days and I wore the leather gauntlet and I because I'd actually I'd, I'd written a scene already where Agnes is flying the kestrel and I had described <laughs> the kestrel landing with a thud on her glove and actually when I flew a real kestrel they're about the weight of a kitten and they're so silent and they appear on your glove almost without you noticing they just glide onto it and one minute there they were not so I had to go home and completely rewrite that scene because kestrels mm. are tiny and very light and the other thing I did was um, plant, uh, cultivate and plant my own Elizabethan medicinal garden mm. with all the herbs that would have been used. Mm. Um, and actually, I, I read somewhere that every household would have had them and every woman of the house would have known how to use them. Because, of course, you know, they, doctors were expensive and yeah. medicines were so scarce. And, you know, so people, women handed down knowledge about these plants that you could help your children and your parents and your household with. So I... I created my own garden which I still have actually I still cultivate it mm. um it's, it's so it's a, yeah, thinking of that lovely passage where or heartbreaking passage where Ophelia hands Gertrude the rue um and of course we have rueful as regretful That's um, right. yeah. so it's it's just interesting thinking about the roots of these words as well to keep them yeah. pun going um so we've got um a couple of oh uh, so I'm sorry, um, Laura, was there somebody who wanted to ask a couple of questions from the chat? Uh, yes, there are. There's a question from Alex Christie, and it is on, I know you touched on the care you take for writing about historic figures. What is different? Alex's question is, what particular care do you have to take when writing about real historic fixture, figures versus invented characters? How is the, how is the approach mm. different? Well, I think you have to be, I mean, I think it goes back to what I was saying about the research, you know, the, I mean, there are very, there are, you know, as I was saying, a, a few concrete facts known about Shakespeare and there's an awful lot of swirling rumours and conspiracy theories about him too. So I read, I, I gathered as many of the concrete stuff where there's actually documentary evidence of him being in a certain place at a certain time. Um, and I also read through a lot of the conspiracies, you know, of course, that, you know, there's all these theories out there that he didn't he didn't write the plays there were a number of people who wrote the plays or you know there are theories about him being a spy I mean you know there's anything you name it there are there are people who are convinced that he's this or he's that or you know he was gay or he was you know he was um I don't know I mean there's so, you know you name it it's but and there's the one theory that he he was in the in the name you know he went to sea and traveled all over the place and you know and it's you know it's all kinds of stuff so I think I, I read through all those and tried to decide whether or not any of them had any any for me any any kind of credence and I think I tried really hard I mean there were only I think there were only a few I think there's only one or two things that I went against one of the things I actually renamed one of Shakespeare's sisters 
um, he had one surviving sister that he had, there were two sisters older than him who died in infancy. And then there was a, no, actually there was, there was one who died when she was seven called Anne. And then he had another sister who was called Joan, who actually he was clearly very close to because she lived a long time and he left, he allowed her to live in a house that he, he she's mentioned in his will and he gave her uh, permission to live in the house on Henley Street, the, the apartment. But so I had to, because, um, Agnes's mother or possibly stepmother was called Joan. It's too confusing in a novel to have two characters with the same name. So I gave her a different name, but I don't think there was anything else that I went against. I think mm. you just, you have to be careful and you have to be, I mean, the, the only person I think who possibly I may need to apologize to is Shakespeare's father, uh, John Shakespeare, who it's quite possible he was a very charming man and lovely and he and William got on really well, I don't know. <laughs> but um, <laughs> in, my, in my book, he's a bit of a violent despot yeah. um, because there is an awful, I mean, compared to his William, actually, who I was saying there are very few documents, John, his father, um, who was a, a very successful glove maker, has an absolute reams and reams of documents about him, mostly um, fines and he's owing a lot of money and he is he's uh, he's in court because he won't go to church and I mean he's a very he's a strange character I got the feeling from all these documents that you can see about him because he had been a very successful businessman and he'd been a high alderman he'd been a bailiff which is basically like being the lord mayor of Stratford and he had lots of civic duties but then at the time William married Anne or Agnes, um, the family fortune had taken this huge nosedive because he'd started trading wool illegally. You, were, you weren't allowed to trade outside your guild yeah. membership. And he, he obviously owed a lot of money all over the town. Um, he, he did bizarre things. Like he, he, at one point he's fined for dumping what they describe as ordure in the street just outside his house. I mean, I don't, I'm not quite sure what that is, whether it's, I mean, you know, obviously he was a glover. So you think the kind of waste material from making gloves from skinning animals it could, probably could have been pretty vile stuff mm -hmm. but just you know I just got the the impression of this rather erratic um personality and also I suppose I was thinking about the in Shakespeare again and again in a lot of his plays you see these quite angry despotic men whose ambition uh you know their reach is exceeding their grasp and ambition comes back to bite them mm -hmm. and I just wonder where that came from no, I thought that was beautiful. Also, Shakespeare's father in real life um, got fined for having his dung heap too close to the neighbour's house. That's right. <laughs> yes, he did. He, I mean, he, yeah, really strange. Very, stra very interesting. He's a very interesting character, clearly. <laughs> um, Grimes asks, what scene was the hardest for you to write? Well, it's probably no huge surprise that it was Hamlet's death that I found the hardest to write definitely but the two scenes of his death and then the following scene where his mother lays him out for burial um I think you know I mean I always knew that obviously I always knew when I was starting to write the book that this scene was coming um and I do remember I do remember when I was coming closer to it with the book when I was coming closer to the halfway point in the book thinking I really don't want to do this you know because you get to know this child I mean the obviously the fictional Hamnet and you know I I'd been felt I knew this time and I, you know he he I felt like I, I'd been living with him for such a long time and then I realized that at some point I was going to have to do this because it's unavoidable um and actually I was looking back in my diary recently for the other I was looking back for something else a completely other reason and I came across this completely blank um, double page and on it I had written I killed Hamlet today mm. and I knew I, I actually found that I couldn't write it in the house where my children live I wrote it in outside in the garden in a shed I mean it's not a glamorous nice shed it was a kind of filthy disgusting old potting shed which is actually now blown down in a storm but I sat in there and I did it in sort of 15 or 20 minute bursts and then I would have to go out and walk around the garden and then I could write it again because it is it's it's heartbreaking but how could it no but that was the whole my whole impetus behind the book that I wanted it to be heartbreaking and I wanted to say this boy was important he was grieved you know without this child and without his death we wouldn't have Hamlet and I don't think we'd have Twelfth Night either you know mm. his death was a, you know caused a huge impact and it's given us you know certainly one of the greatest plays ever written if not two or three mm. I so agree with you um, Maggie, do you write in longhand or on the laptop to begin with? Well, a bit of a mixture, actually. I do take a lot of notes. So I have notebooks for every novel and I 
take a lot of notes in those. And again, if there's a research, I take those in longhand. But when I'm actually create, writing the book, creating the book, I will type, yeah. Mm. Um, so yeah, um, there's a question from Tony Snapes and it's, it's dealing with what he feels is a bit of misdirection. And we were expecting Judith to die, but it turned to Hamnet. How did this twist come about? How did you, what was behind you? Well, I think I've always been intrigued. I mean, I, I wanted with this book to be, I mean, two things really. I didn't want it to be the kind of book that could only be read and understood by people who knew a lot about Shakespeare. I didn't want to exclude people who perhaps haven't had the opportunity to see the plays or read them. Um, but I also didn't want to make too many <laughs> hugely clunking obvious references to his plays. It would seem a gross imposition, I think, for me, you know, to come along and say, oh, this is where he got this idea from, this is where he got that idea from, you know, just, just very, very crass. But I think, you know, there are, I hope anyway, very, very slight glancing references that, that, that are there if you want to see them and not if you don't, you know. And I think, you know, obviously there's a, there is a very strong motif in a lot of his work about boy and girl twins and about them separated or being mistaken for each other or exchanging identities. You know, Twelfth Night, the play which the Globe Theatre dates a year or so after Hamlet um, is about, you know, obviously it features a pair of boy and girl twins who both think the other is dead and that they spend the whole play confused and people mistake them for each other and they put on boy and girl clothing and you know there's all this kind of confusion which is part tragic and part comic of course and then at the end they're magically reunited and they fall into each other's arms and it oh they're not dead after all you know and you read that in the light of what happened to her you know Ham Hamlet and these this boy and girl twins who are separated and how you know how could you not how could you not think that this is what was at the forefront of his mind. And one of the things I read when I was researching the book, when I realized I, I saw a playbill for the first ever production of Twelfth Night. And there was something about the date on it that caught my attention. I looked at it and I thought, oh, that date, I recognize that date. Why do I, why do I know that date? Mm -hmm. And the opening night for Twelfth Night was on what would have been the twins 16th birthday. And that gave me, it was like a, it was a really strange sort of feeling. It's like cold water trickling down my back. And I thought, you know, here is the, you know, the lead player of the Chamberlain's Men who's written this play. Of course, of course, he decided that that should be the date that that, that play had its first premiere. You know, the first night of that play was Judith's birthday. It would have been her, or even just her birthday, of course, but it would have been Hamlet's birthday as well. And that again, it's a bit like the, the moment where I, you know, looked at the names of Hamnet and Hamnet, it felt as though, you know, there was a hand reaching out from history and saying, I don't know, I could just get a sense of Shakespeare the man and the sense of his grief and, and what was fueling his plays perhaps. Mm. And what's so beautiful about this book is you can read it if you've never even enjoyed Shakespeare. So it, 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 you can read it um, as a, just as a beautiful novel and it doesn't have the kind of heavy handedness of some historical novels but then if you've lived your life in Shakespeare um, you then also read it with absolute fascination oh well that's good I'm glad because that's what I wanted to do I didn't want to make it an exclusive yeah. book but I think also the kind of it I think you know often you write the kind of books that you enjoy and I myself actually when I'm reading a historical book what puts me off more than anything or what's more, more likely what's most likely to make me shut it and chuck it across the room yeah. is that this kind of idea that a writer is showing off how much research they've done you know yeah. I, find that, I find that really irritating you know the kind of historical novels where you know they'll say she picked up the phone which was made of bakelite and early form of plastic and I just like oh god god please no don't don't overload this story with all your research you know I think with yeah. research I mean what I decided I think in the process of the book is that you know you need there's so much you need to know you need to in order to write a scene in a room you've got to know what they're wearing you've got to know exactly what their clothes are made of you've got to know what the the cup that they're holding is made of and you've got to know what the floor is made of that they're standing on and what what's on the walls and yeah. what the windows look like but actually you have to edit out you've got to get rid of 95 percent of that you need to know it to have the confidence to create the scene but then you need to ditch most of it and 
wear it very it needs to wear its history very lightly yes I so agree yep um one of the the readers has been oh, one of the listeners today has been saying um something about the book have I read the book I, I imagine interviewing you and not having read the book I love the book I've read it three times I loved oh, it thank you so nice. <laughs> uh do we have more questions Pam There's one from Donna here. Can, may I read that, Pam, if you're having trouble getting on? I'm sorry. I had a little trouble. I had a little yeah. trouble getting through. Yeah. Um, Emily has asked about, it's a John Updike book yeah. about the backstory of, of Hamlet's mother, Hamlet's mother Gertrude. And he had Hamlet's mother Gertrude used Falcon's eyes being sewn shut as an image of women's eyes being shut at the time of marriage. Did the Falcon Association with Shakespeare's first sight of Agnes derive it all from this history? Was that part of my, might have been part of what inspired it? It's, I don't, it wasn't Updike that inspired that bit. I mean, it was mainly, there is a, there are references to hawking and falconry in, there's, there's one in Hamlet, you know, as like a hawk to a handsaw, and particularly in um, The Taming of the Shrew, there's an awful lot of hawking metaphors there you see which actually uh, again uh, I suppose maybe that's where Updike got his inspiration from the idea that you you know you tame a woman you, you make her you know come to your bidding come to your glove mm. in a sense but I always think those Shakespeare's you know obviously is doing that with a great knowledge and it's tongue-in-cheek I'm not sure I don't think he's advocating <laughs> this is how you treat women in that play thankfully mm. um so it was yeah it was something that I yeah, I suppose it was in the back of my mind. It wasn't, it was more, it was more probably Taming of the Shrew and Hamlet than Updike, although I, I do like Updike. Mm. Mm. I'm looking to see if there are any more um, questions. Yeah, there's a lovely one here from Donna. Um, I'll, I'll do it. So um, Donna says, I love this book so much. I finished it last week and can't bring myself to pick up another book and turn away from your book. Can you tell us a bit about how you crafted the multi-page passage about how the plague made its way to Agnes's children? It was fascinating and heart-stopping, this passage. Um, well, I think actually that was, that was a passage um, which I didn't plan. It wasn't something that was in my vision for the book as a whole. It just became clear to me, I think, that as I was writing the first, it comes, it comes about halfway through the book. And I, you know, because most of the first bit of the book takes place in, in mostly in one house or one street in Stratford-upon-Avon. I mean, it also takes place in Agnes's, you know, the Hathaway farm. But, and it just felt, I don't know, there was something about that point. I, I wanted to kind of throw the book open wide and say, you know, this to kind of give it a perspective it wasn't just about this small town the plague was a a global <laughs> issue mm -hmm. as you know we can all very much appreciate now and I do remember at the time it's I mean it's strange looking back at it now because mm. you know when I wrote it two years ago or something um I do remember sitting in my you know my office and my centrally heated house thinking I wonder what it feels like for there to be this illness spreading across the globe and knowing that it could come any moment to your door and you know, it was a sort of, in, it was a kind of, it was all based on research, you know, I was imagining what would it be like, you know, um, for a pandemic to be creeping across, you know, and, but I mean, the thing about the Black Death is it's such a, you know, it's still very vivid, I think, in our folkloric memory. Yeah. Particularly perhaps in Europe, I don't know, I mean, yeah. I, it was a while, you know, it was a long time before it actually reached America. I mean, actually, I think it came to San Francisco first, didn't it? Um, yeah, I think. It, on, that yeah. was by way of Hawaii. Okay. That's right. Yes, that's right. I did read that. Anyway, so I mean, I suppose it's just, you know, I mean, the, the first sort of nursery rhyme as a child in Britain, your tool is um, Ring of Ring of Roses, which of course, some people think is, I mean, I think it's about the plague, not everybody would agree. But, okay. but it was just, I suppose it's just, like, you know, an interesting idea. And I was thinking, well, how would it get there? You know, and the Elizabethans were, were quite materialistic, you know, in a sense that the world was opening up to them and they, they could, they, they liked, you know, they brought all this, this huge numbers of trade routes, you know, that's obviously where, the, why the plague was, you know, was able to sweep all the way across Asia, across, you know, and at one point it killed a quarter of the world's population, you know, 
and it would have been at the forefront of every single Elizabethan's mm. mind. They would all have known the signs of it and the symptoms, and how, you know they would have been terrified. Mm. It was a, it was so mm. such a virulent bacteria that it could mm. kill a completely healthy young twenty-something mm. person within a day. And Shakespeare's and, career would have been constantly interrupted, you know, because the first thing the authorities did was to shut down the playhouses. I mean, actually, there is a, a playbill that proves that Shakespeare was in Kent on tour when Hamnet died. So mm. nobody actually knows whether or not he made it back for the funeral. Mm. But obviously he was on tour because they'd shut the Globe in theatre in London. So it, it was a play. Fascinating. Also, they didn't know how it spread. So no. now we know it was the fleas on rats. Mm. But, but actually, I mean, that was a very late, that was yeah. only discovered in the late 19th century. Yes. Yeah. So it's kind of fascinating thinking this thing. Well, it's so like COVID, isn't it? That, we, you know, mm. at first we thought it was through touching, then through aerosol. Um, yes. Maggie, what are you working on now? Um, well, I'm just finishing. I, 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 I wrote a children's book, which has just come out. So I'm writing a second children's book. And I'm also, I've started another novel. Uh, which is also set in the past, which does, I realise it leaves it quite open. <laughs> the past is quite large. But I, I'm quite super, I, I'm a bit always reluctant to talk in detail about things I haven't finished. Mm. Um, but it is, yeah, I mean, I'm enjoying it actually. It, it took me a while to get over leaving these people behind. It took me a while to take all my Stratford upon Avon maps and mm. photographs of uh, Henley Street down off my pin board. But now I'm, I'm deep into another world now, so I'm really enjoying it. Wonderful. And the, the children's book you've finished, is that out yet? Like, can we get it? Yes. Yes, it's out. Yeah. It's called Where Snow Angels Go. And it's about a little girl who wakes up to find the snow angels she made the previous winter. He's manifested in her room and he's there on a mission to save her life. Great. Where Snow Angels Go. Wonderful. Yeah. I have a, a question from Valerie Sofer. How much time did you spend in Stratford and how did you spend there, your time there to absorb the place and... Would you consider writing another novel about Shakespeare? Well, I would never discount it. You never know what might happen. Um, I, and I did, I went to Stratford on two, I spent several days there actually. Um, and I, I, I mean, I've, I would say to anyone who's even remotely interested in Shakespeare, and if you ever get to Britain again, <laughs> please go and see this, all that has <laughs> the Shakespeare's Birthdays Trust because they are so incredible you know this is i mean let's not forget this is a man who we only have six examples of his signature but through some incredible magic of history and restoration you can walk into the house where he was born and he grew up and you can stand in the room where he ate his meals i mean it, it seems astonishing but it's right there and you can see it and you know the doorways are still there the floors are the same the staircases so it is it it's a magical place and i would say if anyone ever gets a chance please go so I um, went around all the houses several times and I took about 300 photographs and I talked to the people who work in the, these houses, museums are incredible. You can ask them anything and they will, they will know. They're a really incredible resource and they were so helpful. So, and I, I did an event well, online actually in, in Stratford and, and I said, please, if you were there in the autumn of 28, 17 or something, and you remember this kind of slightly crazed curly haired woman asking you a thousand questions, just thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Um, I think we've run out of time. I'll just say one little thing, which is that um, Laura very helpfully gave a couple of bookstores where you can order the book from. Please get it for everybody for Christmas. It's so good. And then the other thing is um, if you can't get hold of it from one of the bookstores, go to Amazon where you can buy it for your Kindle. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank... Um, author Maggie O'Farrell and uh, dramaturg from Cal Shakes, Philippa Kelly. This has just been such a delight and inspiring afternoon with you both. And also this novel is so prescient with, with our time during COVID uh, and also this really searing, beautiful family story. So both historical and personal view of Shakespeare's life and family and I, I want to thank you for this for this great great interaction and conversation and please yes get your books at alexander.com or whatever way that you can and we hope that you'll join us again for another conversation and please go to calshakes.org 
to see all the wonderful things that Philip is doing online uh, with California Shakespeare Theater and also at milibrary.org. And we look forward to seeing you very soon again. So here's a, a, a half a minute to say hello to everybody. And, thank you so uh, much. You so <laughs> and mute yourselves if you want and just say bye. It's good to see everybody. And also, somebody mentioned uh, bookstore.org is a fantastic place yeah. to order yeah. from. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you are very well. Very well. Hi, Sandra. Hi. <laughs> Hello. I already left, I think. Oh, it's, this is the bookstore is excellent in Menlo Park. Great. Oh, and we've got so many of my Shakespeare students here to listen to you today. I'm so happy. <laughs> we hope you'll come back to Mechanics. Thank you so much. This Thank was wonderful. Yeah. Take care. Okay, I'm, right. I'm going to go ahead and Bye. close the doors, everybody. It's this great seeing wonderful. you. Bye. Bye. Loved it. Bye.